says we're live. Hi. That's Roland. Mm-hmm. This is Roland. Yes, it is. Yeah. Let me show it in two. I'm showing it on my stuff. So many microphones. There we go. Phone. Uh, yes, I do. All right, people, start asking questions. I can talk forever, <laughs> but <laughs> there we go. So we go live. Go live. You are now live. There we go. Establish it somewhere, then you'll have to look for. Where are you going? You'll have to look at the questions. <laughs> All right, we have 13 people watching at the moment. All right, do we need questions? I, got, I have a list of there. some here. That's the camera that's actually to Facebook right now. It's going to be that one, the, the close one. So, Which one am I looking at? That one. That one? Okay, cool. Yep. So I will pull up some from the uh, community group first. And we had some from all over the place. We had some from Instagram. We had... All sorts of goodies. There's a delay. That's going to confuse the fuck out of me. Oh, just don't look at it. Yeah. yeah. It's your best bet. Am I looking at the comments or you are? I will. I'm almost okay, there. Okay, cool. Then I won't do that because it's going to drive <laughs> me insane. <laughs> Here we go. Who needs that one? N- nobody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, in case okay. the figure comes about. So uh, there was one that I had seen actually yeah. earlier that I liked here. Uh, jo- Joachim mentioned this one, so we'll dive right in. By the way, hi guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, it's been a long time. It's been. We actually just wrapped up like a almost two hour podcast. Yep. So hence with, the delay. With coffee girl. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the question here is: Hi Julian and team, did your theory and application of the IT and ET muscles change with the nervous system and nutrition developments? No. No. No, no, no. So none of my principles have changed. We have made them more uh, precise as we went. And my interpretation of certain things has been far clearer as I went. But every time we pile on stuff, we ended up piling on the same. It, it just keeps confirming the same ideas. So the ET, IT muscle chain is basically exactly how it started. And if anything, it shows me how... Uh, how right I was on a bunch of stuff because now I started to link the ETIT chain which is a large muscle group to the efferent system so now I understand why it allows you why ET requires a sympathetic reaction whereas the other one is more like toward the flow I understand exactly why now it's an efferent versus afferent system it's the whole stuff it's actually getting clearer and clearer because in the IT and ET chain what was not there was the small muscles yeah right the, the ones you can't feel the ones you cannot control, like rotator cuff, stuff like that. You can work it by doing this, but you can't. I can say squeeze your pec, but you can't squeeze your pec minor. You have to do a movement in order for the pec minor to activate, but you can't mentally go pec minor squeeze. Yeah. But you can do that with a pec major. That's the mating dance, right? You can squeeze your bicep, but I can't do that with certain small muscle groups, right? So there's an entire afferent versus efferent that goes to that. That's from the understanding of the uh, nervous system. So it's just making everything more and more and more precise. Okay. And it's actually confirming the same ideas I had from the beginning. The nutrition, I haven't, uh, I haven't linked to, you know what would be interesting is to see if the nutrition allows certain muscles to grow more than others. I don't know that is possible, but I'd be kind of curious to know. Like, let's say you're more <laughs> in flow, where you'll naturally develop certain muscles more than, let's say, if you're more in the sympathetic side. If you're more in the sympathetic it side, you're going to choose certain sports. It would make sense because you're going to be, you're going to, ch- well, you also are going to be somewhat still more active in certain ways anyways. Exactly. So. And you're going to choose certain movement versus others. But if you can't test for that point. But I'd be very curious to know that if you're a, like, you know, if you were to change the... Um, the nutrition in a certain way would put you more toward parasympathetic and therefore develop certain muscles more. Yeah. You can't, you can't because that's only, that, that idea only works in a vacuum. In actual practical application, there's no fucking way you could prove it. But it's a great, it's a very interesting idea. Yeah. 
have one more from the from the archives here. Um, I just I'm going to kind of breeze through some of the basics or some mm -hmm. of, some of the longer stuff. But uh, Chris here has been following the nutrition system for a while, uh, based on what he get from the podcasts and stuff like that. So kind of with what we have yep. out there for free. Um, he says the rough outline of his week is about five weightlifting sessions a week, about 90 minutes each, a few bike sessions a bike sessions a week. Uh, great results. Uh, he said, I was that guy, 73 kilos, trying to fit in 4,000 to 4,500 calories a day. Um, he said, I'm now stable at 73 kilos with roughly 3,000 calories intake. Um, but he said he does want to build his body weight up, you know, five, he said, to about 80 kilos. So, one, I think that establishes pretty good one, some of the stuff we've been talking about that says, you're maintaining the same, you're outputting the same, but you're eating less because okay, you're eating 3, right. Okay, 3,000 calories at 73 kilos. I eat probably 3,000 calories a day. I weigh 100 kilos. Yes. How the fuck do you... But this is a 1,500 kilo reduction. Yeah, okay. From so what he's been yeah, doing. Yeah, so it's already, you know, yeah, it's already down. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question he's asking is how does he assign calories to try to build size? You don't. Size? This, the problem is not calories. Yeah. At 3,000 calories, you should be gaining weight. So that means that the problem is not the calories, dude. It's you. In the sense of that's how you train. Yeah. Right. That that's where the problem is. So when you say weightlifting sessions a week, like pure Olympic weightlifting, it, like it appears that way. It just says weightlifting. Well, yeah. you're not gonna gain weight doing that. Yeah. Like you want to gain weight. All right. Start to do some assistance work, bodybuilding. Spend start, some time under tension. Spend some time under tension. Like it's you know, that's why you have extremely Suleiman Oglu weighs sixty kilos. Yeah. Clean and jerk one eighty. It's not that that's going to make you bigger. Like the idea that you can snatch more will make you bigger. No, it doesn't. No, that, no, it doesn't. Like, I'm sorry, guys, but it doesn't. Like, so the problem is not the calories. The problem is you're going to have to, if you want to gain weight, you're going to have to start bench pressing. You're going to have to start deadlifting. You're going to have to start doing pull-ups and weighted pull-ups and, and bicep curls yeah. and shit and rope pulls and then and not break and everything. And then you're going to have to train. You're going to have to do the assistance, assistance assistance work like you mean it yeah. the problem is all that preciseness you're putting in the snatch go put it on bicep curls because yeah. most of you are there i'm not saying you especially because i don't know but most of you are there are like uh, you look like my daughter when she doesn't want to do something when you do bicep curl it's like uh why am i here <laughs> right so i see guys doing assistance work and even sometimes the strong fit stuff which upsets me a lot and they look like this is the last place on earth where they want to be you know, they're pulling the rope and it's like. Yeah, the, the assistant like work you're is. you're not there. It's, it's considered an also ran. It's like I do my thing and then I check these boxes and leave, basically. Well, you're checking out. No, you already left. Yeah, that's true. You're doing rope pull, you already left. You're not putting intensity or anything in it. So you're not putting any passion in it, any intent, any focus on it. So yeah. guess what? That's what you get out of it. Yeah. And so you want to get bigger, that should be your mindset. Fuck me, I'm going to get bigger. All right, so let's get into a heavy yoke. Let's do some bass and curls. Let's do, you know what I mean? But if you think snatches and clean jerks are going to allow you to gain, how much do you want? Seven kilos of muscle? Yeah. Fuck me. You know what? Take time. Yeah. Seven take kilos time. of muscle? Fuck, yeah. I wish I would. Do you know how long it might it take a couple years. For me to be 107 at the yeah. same body fat I'm now? Well, in one year, I'll yeah, say I don't I'm think, juicing. I don't know what I'm doing that. Yeah, one. I don't think you get to do both too. There, there is a, there is always going to be a oh, yeah, little okay, bit of a leanness so, cost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he probably couldn't get fatter even eating 4,500 because he's already uh, that's his metabolism like that and everything. He's probably not digesting the way he should. But improve your digestion and fucking follow a training program that allows you to gain weight. But pure Olympic weightlifting is not going to be that. Yeah. Obviously, it, and obviously, it's not fitting for him. So, but you're not going to gain muscle out of Olympic weightlifting yeah. in a way that strong men and bodybuilding will do for you like I, there's no way around that one man yeah i can help but not with <laughs> olympic weightlifting programming yeah i will uh let's see here you'll be laughing so someone says something funny no no well i, I do have one that i want to go to next but yeah. i just want to make sure that there isn't anything more important first uh so this one here somebody had asked uh to look at, al it's it's we have so many cameras now we have i think we have instagram the thing that's going to youtube facebook and then I'm trying to read from a lot of sources. So Kayla, if you see questions, just raise your hand. Well, but can you stand, yeah, can you? Well, One of the Facebook questions was, if you've never done something like this before, what's the biggest thing you can gain from the protocols? Uh, clearer signals, better sleep, less cravings. 
Like literally, this is what it is on the protocol for. Just a radar that we l I can look in your direction. It's in the. <laughs> you can show me your butt too. That works, but that's kind of unsettling while I'm talking <laughs> to other people. So now I don't know who to look at anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the idea of the protocol is literally is built for three things: better sleep. We're talking REM, you know, more time in bed, but basically better REM sleep, better deep sleep, better sleep overall. Like waking up rested in the morning instead of like you haven't slept in a month. Um, Loss of cravings, like you're not thinking about food all day, you're not just like, oh, I need sugar and all that shit. Understanding what true hunger is, because we realize most people have no clue what hunger is. True hunger, like sometimes you just freak out. You think you need food, you don't. You're just freaking out. So it's a sympathetic response that leads you to think you need uh, food, where actually what you need is to change your behavior. And then the third one is uh, very clear signals from your nervous system. What do you call that? Emotional clarity? Yeah, mental clarity. I, mental clarity. Mental I mean, clarity is but a, that's is even beyond one. mental, though. You know what I mean? It just is. I think it's just clarity, man. Like, yeah, it's clarity from your nervous system. What's a parasympathetic versus sympathetic, and yeah. clear signals. I yeah. think that's a better way I can explain it. Yeah. It's clear signals from your system. And if I think if you don't understand what that would feel like, I would say there probably is just some noise. Noise. Yeah, in the way. yeah. You know, like sometimes you don't know how you feel. Like you don't know if you're in flow, if you're in fight, and even if you concentrate, you're. Yeah. Inside it feels like this is because basically you get mixed signals all the time and a lot of it is nutrition where you get carbs that drive you sympathetic and protein that want to drive you parasympathetic and your system was no fucking clue which way to go because you told him to do the two exact opposite things at once. So it's like yeah. this and then so you can you, you can never do, be truly parasympathetic, truly sympathetic and, and so you end up in flight or freeze basically. So that's what the protocol was designed for. I have I leaned out a lot on it, but some people have gained weight. It's just you get out of it what you put in yeah, it. Yeah, really. for, like for, for me, it was a matter of in the beginning, I had to just remove the noise, which meant yeah. my body was just going so, to take so me to, to what yeah. I needed, yeah. which for me was, dude, you got to get fucking, you can't be this fat. <laughs> That's kind of what it was for me. It's, yeah. like, it's like, Tyler, you got to get lighter. And it just came that way. So I wanted less. I, I craved less. Everything just got to you, I got you, a good You know point. what it was? Me was what or weight. Yeah. Yeah, because you were... I was holding water. a lot of water. Yeah, I was, that's what I discovered is I was carrying so much water. Like I probably have, so at the time I was 105, 106. So I've lost only five kilos, five, six kilos, even though I'll, but I went from probably a 15, 16% body fat down to a 10. Yeah. So if you look, most of it is water. Yeah. Like I don't have the exact number because my scale t puts me at 18% right now, which is not fucking possible. I'm probably on the 10. Yeah. So, but um, I don't have the variations from before. Unfortunately, I should have done a water test when I started, but I didn't. My guess is at the time I was at 15, 16, and now I'm under 10. So most of that, most of the weight I lost is water weight. I, I don't, I realize now how much water I was holding uh, around my waist, especially low abs and stuff like that. It's been mind boggling. I didn't know, I've discovered stuff about myself since I started the nutrition that I'd never told myself fully. Or autism being one, like I've accepted certain things about myself since I'm from having clear signals that have been literally life changing to me. Like I, I would have never handled uh, Kyla the way I did without the nutrition because I was very clear in my signals. I was clear what I wanted with her. It, 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 nutrition has changed my life. I'm not saying the protocol will change your life. I'm saying it changed mine. And so I saw the results on myself and now a hundred others that leads me to think that this shit is extraordinary. Yeah. Okay. We have a lot of questions coming in now. All right. So we're gonna so now I have to do my best to say, Julian, no fifteen minute answers. Oh <laughs> you got, you break my heart just straight <laughs> off the bat like that. Honey, would you give me some water, please? So 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 the first one here is actually it's kind of a two part, but uh, he's just asking about the what people had experienced for from sleep. He yeah. said he had heard where like Sometimes people will wake up earlier in the middle of the yeah, night. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. And and he said it is. He wanted to elaborate that it's not about people saying they. Thank you. Uh, he said he. Oh, I'm sorry. He said he's talking about people that use the protocol that their sleep probably isn't the best, even though they're using it. Not that it was horrible before and it's good now, but how is how do they kind of move it towards better while they're working on it? Once yeah. you're in the game, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you move around? Th that's what happened. At, well, I explained what happened to me at first because I saw that being duplicated time and time and time again. So I start the protocol, right? And I've always been a bad sleeper. Like I've never actually checked REM versus deep sleep. That's something I've done lately once I got the aura ring, but I just 
did you know like you wake up in the morning and you go fuck me i'm more tired than when i went to bed last night yeah. like i would go to bed like ready to kill the world and wake up looking like i don't want to go outside yeah and you know an hour and a half to wake up fucking seven shots of espresso and i'm still barely like all right uh, slap yourself twice in the face otherwise you're not stepping out oh yeah I, and by the way i would usually sleep from like 11 to 3 and then i'm up to go pee and then i'm fucked yeah then it's t tossing and turning every 15 minutes uh like like this constantly right so i start the protocol and my sleep got better fast which was thank god because that was the point of the protocol but it got uh i didn't know what to expect of the protocol at first because um i started going like okay there's certain things that bother me with, with nutrition that should not be the way it is and so i processed the stuff and i was like i'm going to do a protocol based on the idea that i'm going to eat for what's coming sympathetic during the day parasympathetic at night so all the stuff i'm like okay let's try that and then i'm like we'll see what happens first few days i lost water weight i was like oh that's interesting i like seeing my abs more I'm like yeah, hey, i'm <laughs> going to keep on going on that then i get into keto i was like all right that's but the biggest part was the sleep so now instead of waking up at three and going like this i wake up at three but i go right back to bed but now within a week it's 4 30 in the morning and i'm like this and i'm not going back to sleep because i'm so energized i'm like man i'm on fire i'm gonna ride this bitch grab the shotgun and kill off everything go. oh <laughs> off i go and so to a point where it's four in the morning i remember i ended up going to the gym because i was like i'm like like this i'm like what else am i gonna do so i ended up training every single day at fucking 4 30 in the morning like to the point where i have pictures of me in the gym with the sun setting so up what why do you think that was the so case? so what was happening was before i was getting probably six hours maybe of shitty shitty sleep yeah. and now i'm getting five of really really good sleep i discovered that i could not handle more than four four to five hours of really good sleep because my body was like we're good yeah <gasps> like it was like suddenly my um, REM sleep is sympathetic deep sleep is more toward parasympathetic my REM sleep went up so much because I can tell because my dream became very vivid yeah suddenly I had instead of dreams like that my dreams became so strong so vivid you know like when it tells in the matrix like you're in the shit yeah like oh you, know, you like, wake up like I, I know kung fu yeah <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> i was like there's zombies i'll smoke all of those motherfuckers uh so and suddenly like the dreams are so vivid so now it's four in the morning and i feel fully rested yeah and i was because my five hours of sleep four hours really sometimes were of more quality of better sleep than my seven before in bed tossing and turning and so i ended up for a uh, a week and a half to going every single day at four in the morning four and a half in the morning in the gym and i'm like what the fuck is happening so now i'm starting to get worried because i'm losing sleep in my mind yeah i'm losing because it is less hours yeah there's less hours i'm like well that can't be good i mean sympathetic all day i'm gonna crash and i'm like but i'm still not crashing and i'm thinking maybe i'm dropping water weight because i'm uh, so stressed is that what this is it's like i don't understand but i'm not tired that is so fucking weird i'm not getting naps i'm like I i'm gonna crash so bad except i never did and then at some point that four hours turned into five that turned into six turned to yeah. seven so what i discovered is i had to train my way into sleeping six to seven hours of quality sleep every day because i wasn't ready instead of nine hours of shitty sleep seven seven to eight hours so, so I, I was getting four of good it, sleep and that was by the way that was more sleep than i had before yeah. is because quality was so much superior and that conditioning i think is the most important thing to start with right so in the beginning it was the same way for me i would get up about three o'clock wide awake yeah. Um, and then with yeah. time, like I said, you yeah. I just condition it. You get that was just more sleep than I was used to getting. It's the same thing as when I switched to my CPAP. When I switched yeah. to my CPAP, I'd wake up after four hours like, oh, fuck, I'm awake. But so that made you worry. And right? It was the same yeah. thing. I was like, well, I need to get back to sleep. It's like, well, yes. But so you, you can yeah. condition your way to that because you'll get used to it. But then you can apply first. that yeah. extra energy to your training and your day. You get more yeah. done. You but at first, better. Yeah. it's going to shorten. It's a little bit like if you were to eat 300 grams of protein and I show you how to die, but you're such in a shitty state all day that you digest only 100 grams of protein. Yeah. If I give you better digestion, now instead of getting 100 grams out of 300, you you'll get 200 grams yeah. out of 300, you'll be like, I can't handle that much protein. So you'll have to actually eat 150 grams of protein and absorb it. And you will still get more protein than before when you got twice the amount of volume but only a third into your system 
Now it, that's the same idea. And the question did mention maybe uh, sure. meal timing, like eating protein. Should a person, if that's happening, should it, would you change the time you eat your protein at night, or would you just, if that's happening on in the beginning and you feel like you're getting better sleep, just waking up early. Don't worry about it. Ride Don't that out for a while. Ride that out. As see what happens. Exactly. See how you feel on the other end. But the, of the, the key day. is it's auto regulation. That means that as the signal class gets clearer and clearer, you will naturally go toward the stuff that works better for you. So that's the point of all this is I don't want you to plan ahead. Six months from now, I'll, I'll eat at that time and go to bed at that time. Because the point is you don't know. I'm nine months in and I'm still reading reaction from my body. As every six weeks, eight weeks, I can tell I'm different. I keep getting leaner mm -hmm. while I'm staying at the same weight. I'm still I'm getting stronger right now because my training is coming back up. But I'm getting leaner almost on a, every week. I can tell I'm a little bit leaner. But I'm still reading reactions differently than before. So now I start to realize that my deep sleep is never good. I'm at 35 minutes a day. Sometimes I get an hour. Or most days I'm at 30, 35 because of my incapacity to go toward the flow and everything. And I'm working on that. And that's what the nutrition is giving me. The protocol is giving me is the control over my state. I know when I'm, in, when I'm in flight. I know when I'm in fight very well. Freeze versus flow is harder. So now I'm, I'm learning what flow versus freeze is. And I'm learning to change my behavior to be better, a better human being, better at what I do and everything, because I did not have control of freeze versus flow before. I, just, I wasn't even aware. That's what the protocol has given me, is an awareness of my own signals. And that is to, mind boggling to, to, to me. To extrapolate on that, here's a, yep. here's a question from Kristen. It says, uh, did you get signals to ever take full rest days from training? <laughs> Or does your body want to go into a sympathetic state at some point every day, whether it's yeah. a little more cardio or heavy training? No, okay, so basically, honestly, the way we've been built 300,000 years as hominoids is sympathetic during the day, parasympathetic at night. Like, mm -hmm. can you see? The problem is environment, right? Is the idea that we can take a full rest day, sure, but the lion might not. Yeah. So we should be, you should at the very least be capable on any given day. You should be capable on any given day. If you have one day where you're so fucked up, you need to stay at home all day, not socializing, so complete freeze, complete flight, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. That means you're about to, that, that means like you're in a fucked up state. And what right? about rest day just from training? Yes. You well, know, okay, of course, so, right? Okay, for sure. Like this Sundays, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to go sympathetic today. Yeah. Like it's going to stress me out. If I had to, I could. I just don't want to go there. All right, so active recovery. Yeah. You still want to move. Yeah. And sometimes I still move, so I go on my bicycle, I'll go on the bike for 30 minutes at the gym, I'll do a light pump session, but I want to do stuff. I'll go play pool. I'll, I never want now to stay at, at home doing nothing, like you can ask her. So on our off days, we walk, ten, we walk the town mm -hmm. on average 10 kilometers. Yeah. A few hours here and there. So base level of activity is a good point where it's like, and I my, feel like stressing myself. He has climbed so much. Yeah. My base level of activity, I kid you not, has quintupled compared to before. They, I used to want to stay half the day at home doing zero, yeah. nothing. Now I can't even stand it. I'm like, let's go walk. Let's go do stuff. Let's go, go on a bicycle. Like I'm constantly moving. I realize how lazy I was, I guess. Mm -hmm. Freeze, whatever the fuck <laughs> you want to call it. Um, one wait, more. Kyla had, did you have one, Kyla? You want to run with? The bread of cost is you ask for people with backgrounds where they eat carbs in most every meal, like uh, Southeast Asians. How does that make their gut flora change? Well, we don't. Most likely, it leads them to world prevotella. The problem is not carbs at every meal, as long as say. So the problem isn't carbs at every meal. The problem is carbs with protein. That I don't think we should get, right? I don't. I think that's an invention that is much later uh, in mankind's history, and I believe that's the one that fucks up the signal when you have protein and carbs, because one tends to do go toward rest needed needed for digestion, because protein are very heavy on a digestive system and requires rest and parasympathetic state, whereas the carbs basically drive you toward the sympathetic state. So I believe that carbs and protein cannot be eaten together. After that, you can have the protein all day, the carbs all day if you want, if you can use them to go toward fight. You have to understand that for the Friston stuff, and let, let me just narrow it down, because again, he said no 15 minute answer, <laughs> that um, if you eat and you raise your energy level by eating carbs, you're going to associate that energy with a state. If you choose to, uh, if the state that you choose for some conscious reason, many different reasons, is flight, that means that the carbs will give you more energy to go to flight, which is crashing. Maybe you choose a freeze. That means the carbs will give you more energy to crash. 
right? So if you can be in, fi in fight all day, then you can have carbs all day. A lot of fighters eat carbs all day because they continuously go after it, right? So on days off where you feel like not stressing out and being at home, which means going between flight and freeze, if I give you carbs, it'll make you crash harder which might not be what you want. So I don't mind getting carbs all day if you can keep yourself in fight all day. But you have to understand that whatever state you choose, when you raise your energy level, that state will have more energy. So if you put yourself in flight, you'll have more energy to go toward flight. Is that what you want? Yeah. So this one here, I wanted to get to this in the beginning because it was uh, not that complicated. <laughs> and it's for me. Uh, he said, how exactly does Tyler's two shots of whiskey after training affect him? What is the desired effect way. there? What does, when does it apply and when doesn't it? Uh, how does two shots of whiskey after training affect me? Well, probably less than it does most people, first off. <laughs> first off. I'm really, really, really big yeah. and drinking whiskey is just a thing that's, yeah. that's in yeah. my genetics. I can, two shots of whiskey is like a quarter of a shot for most people. Yeah, it's a family uh, but, tradition. But, but, I, but, I but, I but I would say this, the desired effect for me is one, Listen, I enjoy the way it feels. And after training, I've been, I've been experimenting system. a lot with training uh, almost fasted. I have some fats in the morning. This is not things I'm fully recommending. It's just experimenting. Um, but I'll go into my training sessions fasted, and I'll get done training. And the nice thing for me is I have about a, I don't know, 10-minute walk and a 30-minute bus ride and another five minutes to walk home and after I, I like train to every day. Shit. So you get <laughs> yes. done with it. And, and here's how I think. Right? If, if I get done with a good session... Uh, it allows me to almost frame that in my head, like ah, I have a moment to reflect on it, and I just check it. Yeah, just like the reward system. And if I have a bad session, it also puts that into perspective Makes for me. Makes me feel better though. about it. Well, yeah. it's true. And so what I'm saying is, if you have a good day, you can drink whiskey, and if you have a bad day, you can drink whiskey. Pretty much so. By the way, so <laughs> as a reward system, I have to say we've been doing the same with Carla. We have two drinks almost every night. Yeah. Like Monday, everything is closed. I'm like fuckers. <laughs> Can't train on Monday now. Uh, we use it as a reward system. Yeah, we finish training, don't eat. We just go get drinks, and it elevates the buzz. Yeah. So usually it's with Carla, so we socialize a lot and everything, and the buzz we get, which means we talk nonstop for an hour, it's awesome socialization. And then we're like all like this, and then we go eat, and it's an awesome evening. Mm -hmm. So we, I've been using it as a reward system, even though alcohol drives more toward the sympathetic. But it has worked really well. And by the way, I still haven't gained weight from it. Yeah. It's and, the and, weirdest thing. But. And, and I feel this way too. It's like in my training, especially if, if I'm having an especially heavy day, that ends up being a pretty intense, uh, yeah. you know what I mean? Like if you really, really got to bring it. By the way, um, it's cheap because you had two drinks and you're buzzing. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. So, so but, but for me, as I go through that, that fallout afterwards, yep. it, I don't like that just complete drop off. So, yep. um, and the other thing is I don't have a sweet tooth. So I like whiskey more than I like and yeah, sugar. Yeah, yeah, we are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's true that the, it keeps you in a sympathetic state, but in a good way. At least, I guess, again, I'm not saying go pound a bottle of whiskey by yourself and be angry at the world because you're on social media. But the way I do it is with Kyla and then we socialize and that's all moment together at the end after the training at the end of the day because that's, we do it always before dinner because that's our transition from the end of the day to we're going to chill, have dinner, be at home, and relax. So that gives us that break in between mm -hmm. from a sympathetic state. So we ride the sympathetic state with the booze and then we come down through socializing and that leads us to dinner. Yeah. It's like a and that fucking works so well. It's like a bridge, yeah. you know. It's just it a, is. Yeah. That's how, so I treat it as a bridge and as a reward system and, and for, it has worked really well. And for some people, it's Not just... Not for my wallet. <laughs> for some people, it's just a little... Well, you pick the wrong places. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you pick the right places. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. I'm, I'm a... Yeah. Yeah, I know you're a cheap date. Yeah, yes. I know. But uh, I don't know. I do have another one. He's here. married. I'm not fucking with it. Don't worry. It's all good. Uh, this Again, question here safe, don't worry. said that uh, when you started the nutrition it, protocol, it sounded like, like both of us, our, our overall strength did seem to go down a little bit. And now we appear to be getting back. Well, you know why my strength went down? Because I stopped training the way I used to. Got you. I got soft. Because yeah. on the road, I didn't you mean, have no, the I, no, no, no. I mean, when you started the protocol, did your strength go down no. when you started? So this is the difference between the way the beginning went for Julian and the way it went for me. Yours oh, was right. from a much more, you, you stayed within a pretty close percent. You were gradual, so you were able to match your output to your intake oh, yeah, totally. very quickly, right? Totally. Because Julian, I think, was much closer to 
uh, like a stable baseline. Oh yeah, I only lost five six kilos. Yeah. Whereas whereas I lost over fifteen kilos. Yeah. And actually in Fast. in like it says I, like it was in twelve weeks, but it was more like nine. And granted. Probably three or four of those kilos were water, but that's a lot of weight to yeah, peel so off. For me. me, it's six kilos, four or five being water mm -hmm. over nine months. Yeah. And by the way, the first three kilos were in the first two weeks. Yeah. So, 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 I've, so I've been super gradual with this. Yeah. So I dropped it pretty dramatically because I, it's just what my it's what my body needed. You know, the truth yeah, is, man. I had a really hard recovery from a training yeah. competition season. Uh, I had never felt as bloated. I was yeah. as heavy as I had been since before I started training. Um, and I felt strong, but I was breaking. Yeah. So I got into the nutrition just to be like, man, find me what no, plus health you didn't, is. You were not training heavy at the time. No, because I couldn't. You didn't I didn't feel exactly, good. you were broken. Yeah. But as soon as I then got back into training with this, yes, for sure, my numbers were down. But I, was, I just needed to train them back up. No, plus, and the way yeah. I tell now, and I always go out for this, because I used to tell people, if you want to press more weight overhead, yeah, just pile on another five, 10 pounds of body weight. It's yep. an easy way to get more weight. Yep. You want to bench more, weigh more. It's yep. the way to do it. Yep. So those are, that's how I, can, how I can always tell if my strength is moving, if my body weight stays the same and those numbers go back up, or if my body weight drops and they stay the yep. same. Exactly. So right now, like my like push press with a barbell mm -hmm. and log stuff yep. and bench press is all at or within 3%, I think I did 2 or 3% of my all-time PRs. Except I'm 15 pounds. to 20 yeah. kilos lighter than I yeah, was yeah, when yeah, I started crazy. this. So. Yeah. No, plus me, at the time, I wasn't as strong as I wanted because my training has changed. Because so, people don't understand. I took, I mean, obviously being on the road uh, was rough. But since I came back here, I wanted to go on training. But I had to test a lot of that shit. So people don't understand, like, the testing always goes through me. So that means that when I wanted to find that Super Saiyan workout and external talk, I had to train like that. So I couldn't do... The training I wanted. I had to go to hard conditioning to try to put myself in freeze and take it to flight, to fight, to flow. Yeah. All this has to be experimented, has to be tested, right? So I did it first. And so I'm like, oh, I'm going to put myself in freeze. I can't put myself in freeze with strong men. Because yeah. now, mentally, Cause that's, your department. that's my thing. So yeah. mentally, I'm way too strong to go there. So I did cardio. I did like the runner because that puts me to freeze real fast. And then I learned to go myself to flight, to fight. What's the difference? How does it feel? And so my training has been forced upon me because of all my testing. So now, basically, what I'm doing is I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to get strong again. So I'm staying at the same weight, but my strength is starting to come back up. But that wasn't because of the protocol. I was because my mindset was not in getting stronger in a yeah. strongman way. Because at the time, I was like, that's not what I need to test. What I need to test is the shit I don't like. Yeah. Still don't like it, by the <laughs> way. What? Changes, mouth um, they've seen the same changes and sleep and dreams that, that you are describing. And they mm -hmm. to I can. That. I have a little bit to weigh in on this uh, only because when I started using my my breathing machine, which is automatically yep. a sleep improvement, right? I'd use the full face mask, and I am a mouth breather by yep. definition. If you describe me one way, Tyler <laughs> is a mouth breather. Uh, but this, so even when I would sleep with my mask, I would breathe. Yep. in my mouth uh, i switched to one that goes only in my nose and the only way it can work if my mouth opens all the air blows out my mouth so i don't tape my mouth shut mm -hmm. but it it is shut and uh that changed my sleep quality yeah. a ton it was already a huge step so yeah mouth breathing is sympathetic yeah. so it drives you in sympathetic so you never go in the you never go in the state you need to be on for certain parts of your sleeping pattern. So the mouse taping could work very well for that, except yeah. I'm not doing that shit. Yeah, <laughs> not with that mustache. Like, if, okay, <laughs> if I have a choice between doing it through nutrition or fucking taping my mouse at night, I'm choosing nutrition. I'm just saying, yeah. by the way, uh, it's great that it improves your sleep and your uh, sleep and everything. But if you need to tape your mouse shut to improve your sleep pattern, there's something wrong going on. If I... Here's the deal. I can't walk up the Are stairs. Are you guys with, fucking kidding me right now? I can't walk right up now. the stairs without breathing through my mouth. But I can sleep with my mouth closed. No, but... So you can try that. No, but this is... <laughs> if I snort cocaine, I feel a lot better. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, I don't... Let, how about this? What if it's just we just say nasal breathing while you sleep? That's good. Seems to be a good thing. I snort, I snort <laughs> cocaine. There's a way for you to stop snorting cocaine. Glue your nostrils shut. It worked really well. <laughs> Well, there's always a way around But that. yes, by the way, I'm joking, <laughs> but uh, uh, mouse taping proves you that 
the state you're in will change your sleeping patterns. So the point is change your states. You should be able to know what your states are. To do, the, to do that, I found that the nutrition protocol was the best way to get at it. Yeah. I have another question here. By the uh, way, and then eventually you'll go back to the same shit. Is, uh, so I want to know more about what Richard said in the podcast about the uh, emotional mapping of muscles. And I want to notice how that project is going. It is. It's going. It's, it's going. So um, we have a big one with the Friston that mm -hmm. it's leading toward, that explains where the um, emotional mapping comes from. So now I get a better grab, uh, grab on that one. And also we started to look at Eastern medicine and the way uh, physiotherapy has evolved. And if you look basically, it has evolved from the principle of uh, Eastern medicine of associating certain small muscle, rotator cuff or whatever, with certain traumas. So basically the small muscles relate to the afferent system, body telling the brain the problem and stuff like that. Yeah. And that comes straight from Eastern medicine. That's what physiotherapy started to build upon. That's... Um, Dr. Spinoza, FRC, FRT, FRC, all that stuff is let's control the afferent system, right? That goes through the small muscles. The Eastern medicine actually has associated some of those small muscles with certain emotions. So you could see how through the afferent system, emotions and small muscles are linked, but the only way you're going to get to those small muscles is by activating the large muscle groups, because that's the one you control with this. That's the efferent system. You can't squeeze your, your pec minor. You can make, if you move a certain way, you make it squeeze, but you can't command it. So that means that by commanding the efferent system, the mind to the body, I can make the large muscle group move that will in effect make certain small muscle move correctly, which will free the emotional uh, energy that is controlled there. And then so we've been able to do that, starting to map all those emotions to small muscle to large muscle and link that to the to the Friston model. Yeah. So that's where we are at the time. My problem with all this is very simple. We're talking about behavior modification. Yes. And I'm not giving the keys to that to anybody. Yeah. This is a Ferrari, and p if I put it out there, people will treat it like a lawnmower. Mm -hmm. And I'm not doing that. Yeah. Because you have to understand that it is up to the person to free themselves. I am not about to fucking unleash the stored trauma in your body onto your mind, not prepared and ready to deal with it. And not at a pace with which the person who has to deal with it is choosing. And can you imagine what you could do to someone yeah. with the shit? Because I, I, I know because I'm doing it, but um, I'm barely, I'm very extremely cautious about playing with it, and I'm not entirely sure there are ethics issues on this. This is true behavioral modification. With, yeah. with, like this goes so deep at levels where I'm not entirely comfortable with this. I'm not even comfortable in talking about it because I'm like, who's... Who am I to give my opinion on the subject? But I've seen firsthand the results you can get with that. So the emotional mapping will release some stuff, but it will be controlled and I won't go too far into it. Yeah. I'm not giving the keys to that one to anybody. That car is staying in my garage. Yeah. Because it is one of those things where you can't just be like, hey, I'm going to uh, force you to unpack all your emotional traumas against your will okay, right so, now. Okay, but so I explained my point you know? on this. I have guys that came to me, I have one guy came to me with a serious uh, rape trauma to the point where there were certain muscles were damaged, like as a kid. So like some really fucked up shit. All right, mm -hmm. so let's take this as a, and that's not a theoretical case, that's an actually a practical case, I'm dealing with it right now. Imagine if I free all that trauma. All right, what if I free too much of it? Mm -hmm. What if all that memory store in there comes up? And isn't the fundamental? And he's not ready with it. Isn't one of the things that is by the nature of how that works is that it's stored there because for at reason. the moment you're not you can't deal with at it. At least, yeah. at least at the moment that the trauma happened, it's the only way you can deal with it. And and people say I want I need to deal with it. You need that doesn't mean you want to. And again, you, I'll give you the keys to your own car. Yeah. But you're going to drive it. So I am, will never, ever force this on someone. So what I'll do is I'll teach people how to unlock that in themselves. And they will choose the speed at which they do it, if mm -hmm. they want to do it. That, but the keys will be in their hands. So I will never release emotion mapping. I will teach people how to use it for themselves. 
have two quick questions on the subject. Yep. Will we get into emotional mapping with the auto regulation training group? And is it also something that we discuss more in depth in the mentoring program? It is mostly discussed in depth in the mentoring program because I need you to understand the nervous system first and how to do assessments and, and that kind of stuff. So once you understand the nervous system, you understand how to move the way I need you to move and you can do assessment on yourself or others a certain way, then I can start to explain to you how to use emotional mapping. But mm -hmm. you, what people don't understand is, for example, like, Kyla could tell you, she's, she's right here, is like we drove her to see red. Like she had a burst of anger going through where everything turned red. She would have killed someone close enough to her at that time. Richard tried to put her fingers on, on her and she freaked out. And wow! Like this and everything had to go outside and then she started breaking down and cried for 10 minutes. You want to be in control of that? No. Right, so... Not with that one. <laughs> all right, but uh, we've seen... We've done it time and time and time again. So mm -hmm. Richard is very good at pressing certain buttons now and everything. But again, like, whoa, like you guys, this is fast. This isn't just like, oh, yeah, I'm, thi I'm thinking about my mom. This is a far, far deeper and stronger stuff than yeah. William Reich talked about this, about releasing. That's it basically said he could help schizophrenic. Has, that's character analysis, his yeah. book, where he's helping a schizophrenic person go through it. But imagine the breakdowns that that entails. Read the book, you'll see like she almost fucking stabbed him more than once. Uh, well, she was out there. You don't want to be that she, guy. By the way, she cut someone one day, like a family. Really? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, she was. You read the book, she was fucking. The balls on that guy. Um, so those are very, th those are more sure to do it on yourself. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but so that's most in the mentoring program. In the training, I will make you do it, but I'm you might not know it's emotional mapping, but... Something might be just targeted for you to work on. Yes, but emotional mapping is part of strong fit. Yeah. Uh, so you will do some emotional mapping. I am just not showing you how to use it on others, yeah. but I will make you do it on yourself. Yes. Yeah. In that, so emotional mapping will be applied on you through the auto-regulation training group for sure. What I will not do is teach you on how to use it on others. Yeah. The, uh, I, there's a question here from the StrongFit community group, st the StrongFit community on Facebook. If you're not on the StrongFit community on Facebook, get on it. Yeah, um, by the way, did we share it on the StrongFit community or they, they're going just I on? think they're going, it's just okay, through this okay, thing whatever, here. Yeah. I don't know how it all works yet. I, we'll yeah, we have to share We're it really groups, but I forgot guys. to do it, so yeah, exactly. They all got notified of it. I just don't know if it all landed everywhere, yeah, but I, they'll all see it. Oh, wait, I was supposed to share, I forgot. <laughs> but uh, so we've got uh, a question about um, is it possible to tie the to do the nutrition group and the training groups yeah, at the we, same time? Yes, of course. Well, that's and technically like the nutrition group launches a month sooner than the sooner, training group, so you which is actually kind of how I would prefer right. that you yeah. do it. Exactly. I would like to use nutrition for a month and then do the training, but you definitely want to do the two together. That's the point. That's why we're giving a discount. If you're doing one group, you get a discount on the other. Yeah. Because if you do nutrition, we'll give you a 50% discount on the training because I want to be able to do both together because yeah. then your nervous system will <laughs> out of it like the, it uh, did for us, basically. Just a heads up, uh, uh, the Strong Fit Digital Circus said it, it is shared everywhere, so he's got it okay. under control. Thank you, John. A guy knows man. his stuff. <laughs> Always John, lifesaver. Kyla, did you have anything over there yet? Okay. Um, let's see here. Marco says he just wants the keys to his own whip. <laughs> That sounds you like do whatever <laughs> you need to do at home, man. <laughs> um, uh, one question here. Julian yeah. mentioned in episode 19 that we weren't actually built to sleep eight hours in a row. Yeah. He, he just wanted to make sure he had heard that right, and he was wondering what, the, yeah. what was behind that. So paleontology, right? Uh, I've shown many, many, many times over. By the way, simple reason, because uh, some predators hunt at night. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's the simplest reason of all. Uh, and if you look, paleontology showed us many times that a lot of, we're talking like, you know, 20, 30,000 years ago or more, uh, you had a, what we saw basically was people sleep a few hours, wake up, uh, have food, sex, uh, stop, went back to sleep and in that in bunches. But basically the idea that we fall dead asleep for eight hours straight is absurd for the good reason is you'd be dead by now. Yeah. Right. You had to wake up at three in the morning because you heard a sound because fucking the Romans, are, the Huns are at the gate. Yeah, there's supposed to be moments in which you're not in extremely deep sleep for that reason. Yeah, so if you look, you will wake up two, three times a night. Good. you be fucking dead by now. <laughs> like, if the species was built to go eight hours completely out, 
Imagine what that would mean. Oh, let, let, go camping. Go camping. Can you sleep eight hours straight without ever even going like this at any noise? If that's the case, uh, in another 5,000 years ago, you'd be dead. Let me put it this way, because there were predators everywhere. So you, can you sleep eight hours in a place that has no light, no sound? Most likely, because nothing ever disturbs you. But part of your system is built to wake you up whenever it hears a sound that it shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness. Otherwise, we'd be dead. So in that sense, we're not built to sleep eight hours straight. Now, in a perfectly controlled environment, I have no doubt that we can. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, six, seven, eight hours, whatever it is. But uh, paleontology has shown us that through history of mankind, people used to wake up once or twice. Again, food, sex, the stuff, go back to sleep. And, it's, and some people do that naturally. Like, I wake up to pee whether I need to or not around three in the morning. Like, it's... So I do around. So when Yaya was um, very young, I used up until she was like seven, eight, I used to wake up every time around two something. I go pee, I go back up, I check that she was okay. I would cover her with a blanket. I would kiss her goodnight. If I did not do that, I could not go back to sleep. Yeah. And I was fine, by the way. If I had a break in between like that, I sleep better the second part of the night. If I don't go pee, my dreams are not as good and restful as if I wake up. Usually I go walk around, I wake up, completely and I go back to sleep and then my second part of the sleep is actually better when I do that. I also had a really good one and then I lost it. It was actually one I was just going to defer. So uh, the question is actually, uh, I don't want you to answer this because we covered this in the podcast episode that will be out on, Did we did Friston was the first one we did, so that'll be Wednesday. Yep. So the question is, if everything in our body has a function and there isn't any good or bad, what is the function of chronic pain and why is it increasing in today's society? Now we get into the function of chronic pain very often and, and a lot of the mechanisms with this and this in that podcast episode that you can see next week. But do you want to touch on why maybe yeah, chronic pain is increasing today? That's, so the body has functions, right? And when they run amok, they become dysfunction. So chronic pain is a dysfunction. So in that sense, it is bad because it's a perversion of a function. Right? Yeah. It's, um, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, let's look at depression. For example, a freeze moment is you're in the middle of the fight and the guy does something and you're about to punch and you go, whoop, he's tricking me. That's the strategy. So you're there and then you go, let me see what happens when I do this. And then you stop and then you go, whoop, that, that's a freeze moment actually. Yeah. That is that very, that half a second when the body is resetting to go like, what just happened? So you assess or reassess the situation. That's a half a second that you can have at any moment. The bear comes and you go, mm, mm, mm. You it's a reassess. So a freeze button can be a reassessment tool that you have to when you're in situation, just don't go balls in every time because that can be dangerous. Like I just go like this, I can get killed. So that's what the freeze moment is, is to make sure you don't go and you think about what you're doing. Now that's the function. That's not good or bad in that sense. It's just to allow you to reassess. Depression is when you can't get out of that button. When you're comp constantly reassessing what you do for uh, basically the next five years, where to the point where you can never make a decision on anything because you are constantly reassessing. Like, I'm going to do that. Ooh, I don't know. Ooh, I don't know. Ooh, I'm not sure. So we went from function to dysfunction, right? Function is I reassess and I take a decision. But if you're stuck in that feedback loop, mm -hmm. it becomes dysfunctional, right? That's what chronic pain is. That pain is to basically tell you to not to do something. Right? It's the body goes like, if we go that route, they might be maiming, there might be certain issues. It can be because you made the wrong prediction or stuff like that. So the problem is that's a very valid function. It hurts. Of course, it hurts because it's pain, right? But it's to make sure that you learn your lesson as to not do something. The problem is when you get stuck into that loop, then the feedback loop becomes infinite and you are constantly stuck in pain because your body is constantly trying to get you out of the state you're in. So. It's a function that in itself is not bad. The problem is become, it became a, a loop. Now it becomes dysfunctional in the sense that it's growing you up completely. So that's what chronic pain in itself does not come from a function that is bad. It just became bad because the moment you turn into a dysfunction. Yeah. Because the feedback loop just kept fucking turning and turning and turning. And at that point, it begins to define your existence. Yeah, you exactly. Know? So there's always that moment where, unfortunately, uh, it, it starts to be dysfunctional because now it starts to hurt you instead of helping you. That's really different between function and dysfunction is when does it become bad for you. But um, 
the function itself is never good or bad in that sense. Is you fell into a feedback loop and the only way out is to change your state. It's the same thing for depression. So then if this function obviously is bad, right? But the function itself that started the thing wasn't. It's just what happened with it later yeah. that turned into a bad thing. I think, do you have anything over there? We got one last one. Okay, I have one last one, I think. I think so. So Martin has a good question here. Uh, Martin from Hungary, Martin. Oh. Um, he asked, uh, he said, but by, by eradicating the cravings, um, he said, do you think the nutrition protocol uh, would be useful for addicts? And I did ask him to clarify yeah. uh, drug addicts or food addicts. And he just said all, he, well, he said same. all addicts. It's you know what I mean? It is very much the same. Uh, Yes, to a degree. Um, the key with addicts is, so environment creates behavior, behavior creates identity. If you're an addict, it means at some point, you have created a, an environment in which, a, a freestone environment, in which you have associated drug with making the, the correct prediction, right? Uh, that's basically the problem with that is that's how the nervous system works. That's the... Um, that's the podcast we did about the Frist Carl Friston, so you guys will understand what I mean by that. Um, your nervous system is a learning mechanism that, is, that has one job, and one job only is to make a uh, hypothesis about what something is going to feel like, right? So it based on probability, there's, uh, and he established probabilities of what things are going to feel like. If things feel the way you think they should, you establish a prediction. Once you establish that prediction and it is correct, the system is designed to bound you to that prediction. It bounds you with dopamine and oxytocin, which are extremely powerful glues. It's a glue that is so strong that it's, it will link your personality to that behavior, because that's what it does, environment, behavior, personality. So now, your personality is, let's say, Martin the addict. Right? Because you have created predictions that are kept coming true and that have bound you to that prediction because of what the drug does to your dopamine levels. So it's basically tricking the nervous system into thinking drugs are the correct way to live. And you can't break that because that's what your nervous system is built for. So it's a monster blind spot that we have that allows us to think that something as destructive as drugs is actually correct. Mm -hmm. And you can't rationalize your way out of that because to your system, it is correct. That's the blind spot. Yeah. It is correct. It's like feeding the wrong information to a computer. The f computer once, doesn't know any better at that point. Well, because he doesn't know the information is wrong. So he's yeah. going to make all his calculation based on the wrong of 2 plus 2 equals 5. But you have to understand that to that computer, he's right. Mm -hmm. It's not his problem that the information is wrong. To the computer, 2 plus 2 equals 5 is right because that's what he was told. And therefore, he will make all his calculation based on that. And in that frame of reference, the computer is right. So when you have an, a, a, a drug that made you, basically that made the prediction come true and bonded through dopamine and all that stuff, it's the same situation where technically your system is right. So how do you break that? That's the problem is you're going to have to break the personality. To do that, you have to break the environment. So you're going to have to introduce a new environment where that personality can be switched to Martin B that does not do drugs. So you're going to have to, it's through the test negative and through basically resetting your nervous system into creating a new personality in that sense. And it goes yes. almost as far as changing Martin into John. For sure. To do that, first of all, we're going to have to establish who Martin the addict is. And you need very clear signals to do that. So the nutrition in that sense can help addicts. But there will be the moment where we're going to have to kill Martin. You know what I mean by that? Kill the personality that is Martin and create the personality of John because John is not doing drugs. I don't think they are, if you truly like deep into addiction, I don't think there's another way out. Yeah. Like from what I've seen, what I read, Kyla is very good at this. She has a master's on this. I... I think that's why true addiction is so hard to beat because the environment has defined a behavior, that's defined a personality. If you reintroduce the person to the original environment, they always fall back into drugs. As, as long as they are still that same person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you would have to basically, Mike comes from that environment, that environment produces behavior. So it's environment, behavior, uh, Mike. I take Mike, I put it into a clinic where I change the environment. Well, he's not Mike anymore. Now he's John. 
because John comes from the behavior that comes from this environment. So the new environment has created a new behavior that created John. All right, but then I go back to where I was before. I'm back to being Mike, and Mike does drugs. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is by changing the environment, you get people that don't do drugs anymore. That's why those centers work so well, because yeah. we are creating a different environment which allows you to create a different behavior and a new identity. The problem is if I release you to your old identity, then you're back to being Mike, and Mike does drugs. Yeah. So that's why they fall back into it. And you can't explain to the nervous system any different, because to the nervous system, it is right. Yeah. So the only way, so we, there's two ways. Either we create a new environment and you never go back to your life from before, or I have to kill Mike. And an interesting anecdote on the subjects, like I remember uh, quitting smoking cigarettes, right? So that goes on for, I don't know, probably a decade of trial mm -hmm. and error, mostly yeah. error, right? Yeah. But what happens is a guy goes and a guy quits smoking cigarettes for six months, a mm -hmm. year, which I had done at some point. Uh, and what happens is you, you start to, you don't change who you are, you just, yeah. uh, you change just kind of that action and that's it. So what happens is six months, nine months down the road, you're like, I'll have one, I'll have one. I'm not gonna, I don't want to smoke. I can't control yeah. it. But what happens is then you, it always leads you back to that same road, right? So the way when I finally was just like, I'm stopping smoking yep. cigarettes, is it had to become, and this is the thing I've seen from everybody who's quit anything successfully, mm -hmm. that, you know, from an addictive yep. standpoint, is you now have to be a person who, like I had to say all the time, I was like, oh no, I'm not the person who has a cigarette when he goes out to drink. Yeah, you know what I mean? Changed, I'm yeah. not the person who socially does it. Yeah. That is now something that is, it's, I hate to say this, but that, is, that I am above. You know what? Mm -hmm. I'm, that is, that's because beneath you, me. I don't do that. Because I am not Mike that was person. weaker than John. Yeah. And Mike, I hate Mike. So you killed Mike. Yeah. And the stronger the addiction, the stronger the, the killing process. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. you, so, but Mike, you basically slapped him around and say, you bitch, yeah. and go away. And so, and the stronger the addiction to the moment where you have to basically uh, kill Mike. Yeah. And that's how the process works. It's a freestanding environment. You're not coming off of it. The mental strength that you recall, like your entire sense of self is based on that. You're gonna have to go deep enough to change that. Mm -hmm. Well, we, I, I have a couple of good questions here, but here's the deal. They are going to be long answers. So what I want us to do instead, we have a marathon week of podcast recording up ahead uh, in which I wouldn't mind doing at least one Q&A episode anyways. Sure. So if you have questions on here that I didn't get to, or if you want to get yep. have some questions for a podcast episode, leave them in here and then we'll go through and we'll pour them over. Maybe that'll be what we'll jump into when we film when you get back. Yeah, what we could do too is we get a coffee girl with us and then we answer questions. So ladies, if you have questions from a f where you want a more feminine answer, then uh, Tyler or, or me, uh, we'll ask coffee girls to come on the podcast again and answer those. Yes, definitely. So that'll actually be really good for if you us wanna, to do. If you want to know what it's like to live with me, shit like that, there <laughs> you go, you get the right person. Yes. Um, in, in, the, in the meantime, guys, guys and gals, go to, uh, you know, make sure you're following the podcast. That's where a lot of these things, if this is the first you're hearing some of this, we have one to two hour conversations yeah. about this every week. So, And by the way, we'll do the Q&As every two weeks now. Yeah. It's good. I like, I like it's, yeah. it's a good format. It's easier to do. Uh, I can just fuck around, swear all the time. I like it. Yeah. So, yeah, leave your questions below. Follow StrongFit1 on Instagram, the YouTube channel, StrongFit Community on Facebook. And uh, watch the podcast and tell so a friend. So you say we have two more or we don't? Oh, we're already in an hour. Sure. We're already in an hour. All right, one more question and then we go. All right, we have one more question. <laughs> okay. I was going to be like, no, nah, we're good. I, have, I don't um, think I've ever done a q and in the last than an hour. But see. I want to go get the uh, drinks with Coffee Girl, so you get one we more. Do, we do have one here that says, uh, I'm currently starting with training after almost a year in off-season due to injury and private circumstances. Is there a possibility to get a training protocol during the auto regulation training course for that? Yeah, of course. Definitely. Dude, it's for everybody. That's too, that's, that's too like, easy. And by the way, on, to on the one. auto regulation training group, like you either come with your programming or we'll provide ours. Yeah. Like, so, that's so if you're training towards something and someone already has put in that, the programming work for you, good. We'll help you make it work for you. Yeah. And if you don't have anything, we'll, we'll do it. Something. It can be powerlifting or strongman. We get kind of an eye, CrossFit, we have Coffee Girl. Uh, we can make about anything work. Well, that's the point. But I want to do it from a U level. So not the fucking, that's why we're going to stop the templates because I don't see the point. 
Because if you don't do the stuff the way I want you to do it, then you're not going to get anything out of it anyway. So, yeah. Or not what I want. So we'll give you templates or you bring your own. That was too easy, so you have to answer one of these two yep. really good ones. Yep. Um, and they're both really good. So, <sighs> you know. all right, I like it. All right, so I'm going to go with this one. Julian has stated that our gut bacteria have a large effect on our behavior okay. through the enteric nervous system. It has been seemed at times that you have a deterministic viewpoint, and in many ways the bacteria are running the show. Uh, and maybe even more, I believe he means any, maybe even more than we are. In your opinion, though, is it a one-way street, or can no. I have an influence on the bacteria just as much of as course. they are? Yeah, yeah. So me. that's not what I meant. What I meant by that um, is, first of all, I don't have a deterministic um, view of things because that's a Newtonian way of looking at the world, and uh, mine is quantum mechanical in the sense of everything is a probability, as we see in the quantum medical realm where everything is as a chance of being there or here, it's the same thing with a free environment. On every system establishes the chances of shit happening never is, the, is it deterministic. But um, what I meant by that is, for example, most of the communication of the enteric nervous system, you know, we have a super highway of information, which is a vagus nerve, mm -hmm. right? And it links the enteric nervous system to the rest of the body. The enteric nerve, nerve uh, the vagus nerve, gets the CNS, so brain and spine, all the way to the peripheral, all the way to the enteric nervous system. The vagus nerve, for example, is 80% afferent. It's 80% dorsal. 80, uh, afferent means body all the way to the CNS, basically, right? Whereas efferent system, brain to the rest of the body, is only 20%. So that means that 20% of um, our capacity to tell the body Basically, we only 20%. If you look at the percentage on the vagus nerve, we are 20% telling the body what to do, and the body is telling us what to do at 80%. It's a 4 to 1 ratio. So, in that sense, I believe that, first of all, the afferent system, so my, uh, body to mind, is far stronger than we understand, and we have far less control with this over our body than we think we do. We think it's 80 20, 80% 80 the head, 20% the body, where well, really it's the opposite way. And so, and that's why I refer to in that sense. And, um, but there, there is no question that, for example, changing diet changes the gut flora. That's something you get to choose, you can choose as well. So I believe the brain is designed, that we talk about it in a Freeston uh, podcast, is designed to make predictions. Predictions will uh, allow you to, s to choose an environment. I believe that's actually what we can do as humans, is choose our environment. That is why we do better than any other animal is we get to choose our environment better. We get to build the environment, the environment we want to be in. And we do that better than anybody else. That's why we're on top of the food chain. That you do it with this, with the efferent system, with your head that allows you to choose the environment you want to be in. That's why we do better than other animals, right? And that's the 20% that makes all the difference. But after you choose your environment, the rest, which is environment, behavior, personality, all this comes from your afferent system, right? And that's where the enteric nervous system comes about. You have to understand that we run by genes, obviously, but that's the block of nature that allows us to a, be superior as a species, right? Genetics shape us over the course of hundreds and thousands of generations, over huge numbers and very long amount of time, not for evolution, but for us, right? Genetically speaking, you cannot change. You're stuck with the genes. They, they, being modeled by the environment, but to a large, large degree. You're born short, you're fucked. You're not going to grow taller as you get older. Sorry, like you can <laughs> tell you. Is, I mean, you're not going to look like him if you're 5'6", 160. It's not going to happen. So, but uh, evolution has, obviously, has to give us some leeway because we also have to dominate within our species, right? So it's not enough to just be a block. You also have to be able to, ev in your life, you're going to face different environments. You have to be able to evolve within that, so not physically in that sense you can get bigger or smaller but basically you have to have some leeway at the top some leeway at the top seems to be behavior based and that's where the gut flora comes in the gut flora basically in the afferent system allows you to change who you are based on your environment making you better at surviving it and dominating it so you get to choose the environment with this the rest of your body gets to basically make you better at that environment that's why you get to choose to go into a bad workout but the bad workout is still going to suck because that's how your body feels about it and you don't get to control that. What you get to control is whether you show up at the gym or not. 
that you get a control. But what happens at the gym, that's not up to you. That's your body at the side of the gym <coughs> is a place of safety if it's fight or flight and how the body is going to feel about it, that is not under your control. What you can change is the environment. So you can choose the state to a degree, which means you're going to that workout going, I'm going to kill it. That's the environment of the workout is one when you're in fight and you're going to destroy that. But then after that, your body will do whatever it does. So if you chose a weight that is too heavy, you won't feel like you're killing it because that part is not up to you. And the gut flora is, I believe, the seat of a lot of the stuff in the afferent system, like uh, these links between gut flora and schizophrenia, gut flora and depression. Most dysfunction, it seems, mental dysfunction, anxiety, everything, has been linked to the gut flora in one way or another. Causation versus correlation, we don't know. That's the part where, honestly, we don't know yet. This is very new. Carl Friston has been around for 15 years and the gut flora for 18. We don't know. After that, it's all causation versus correlation. So I can't tell you that the gut flora causes behavior or the gut uh, is behavior having an effect on gut flora. My guess is it goes both ways. Yeah. So, but the vagus nerve, for example, is 80-20. So that's the question is how much do we control versus how much are we being controlled through the gut <coughs> flora and everything. I just thought the idea was very interesting that we assume that consciousness is in the brain, whereas ever being able to prove it, that's an assumption we make, which I think is a Christian Western belief. I mean, Christian Western, obviously, because yeah. Christianity is Western. But I believe this is almost like a soul belief that consciousness is in the brain because it's higher up the ground and all that stuff. Even the Asian cultures actually put the seat of consciousness on top. So always higher. Where does that come from? Not sure. But we are assuming it is up there, whereas the Greeks always talked about basically the importance of the gut. We do, we do say gut reaction. A lot of the intuition we always say comes from the stomach, which is basically our way to deal with the external world, to you know, change the environment and everything. So after that is co correlation versus causation. I don't know. But there's a feedback loop with this one. Yeah. Well, that was a really good answer to a really good question. It was a very that good question. That might have been the most concise explanation of that. I've ever I don't know, we've done like 35 hours of podcasts. Yeah. I don't know where the fuck that was this whole time. <laughs> it's a, a Q&A. I, I, I shine under pressure. That's, that's good. What. Like, give me f one minute. It's on. Nailed. Yeah. Well, no, not one minute. I mean, give you a question. I give five you minutes, five minutes. Whatever minute. you call it. It was, it was one Julian minute. There you go. That's one Julian. It's a unit of measurement now. Exactly. It's my so, unit of measurement. Well, uh, John's got everything posted in here. Um, someone is asking where we can find the information for the discount. I will make sure, I'll talk to John and we'll have that all set up. We'll suppose you have to do both groups to do it together. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll set it up in the store. So I mm -hmm. think, if I, unless I'm speaking out of turn, I'm pretty sure we can set it up. So check tomorrow. Um, I think you can pick one and you can get offered a discount. For I, is that Otherwise, your, John will answer this question I believe directly. there's uh, the imprint of Kyla's shoe onto the wall. Shoes. Okay, so it's not you. <laughs> it's not me. I never wear shoes up here. It's a yeah, yeah it's thing. Not me. Oh, it's my daughter. <laughs> That's a Richard move. Yeah. So, well, that'll do it for us today, guys. But yeah, we'll answer all the questions in here. If you have any more, leave them, and we'll get to them in a Q and A episode Total of the cool. podcast. And we're gonna do this every, uh, hopefully, every uh, couple weeks. And are we are we flexing our way out, or how are we doing this? Wrap. Is this what we're doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's all we have. All right, you got to shut us Two down, weeks. Tyler. Thank you. <laughs>